uh, in terms of our planning. Um, I'll go through the basics. What is a will? What is a power of attorney? What is a representation agreement? What is a uh, advanced directive and how we use those generally? Um, the, the next fifth item um, is concepts of doing it yourself or not and the pitfalls and maybe some of the advantages to doing it yourself and maybe a little bit about how the law has developed now that sort of accommodates a bit more of a do-it-yourself approach. Um, I'll, the sixth item would be talking about doing a good estate plan, but not letting the perfect get in the way of the good and sort of what that means to someone like me who is a professional estate planner and all the different people that can be involved in how these things evolve over time. Um, a little comment number seven about my experience after someone passes away and I get the family in my office and how it feels and the discussions we have for things like pre planning your funeral. Um, and when you don't, I mean, and I'll give you my example of my personal experience that I went through last year when I lost my mother. Um, the, uh, the next one would be a discussion about how transparent you want to be with your family members and the pros and cons and people who tend not to be and the problems I see because of that. And everyone's got different family members and different needs. I, I, I have my own personal point of view because as a lawyer, we have issues that we have to address like undue influence and a lack of transparency or two people in the family knowing, like one daughter knowing everything that's going on and three other siblings that know nothing is a real alarm bell in my head. Like sometimes I can't even do anything because there's not enough family collaboration going on in the plan. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the cost. That's number nine, the cost of everything. You guys all wanna have the general range of what does all cost and, and such. And I'll, I'll sort of explain how I come up with my costing. Um, and then the last one is I'll just touch on the estate and probate process. So after the whole smoke is cleared and then you have to come in and do the estate and probate process, what are we looking at there? And I won't go into too much detail, but you might have questions about that. So getting back to number one, the mindset. Um, I would say I was really surprised with uh, COVID. We didn't get a big rush of people coming in to do planning, but we didn't. There is generally 70 or 80% of people don't plan. <laughs> it's bad out there. And I mean, even me, when I was getting married, my dad, I was a lawyer. My dad looked at me and said, do you have your will done? I went, no. And he goes, okay, <laughs> you go back to the office tonight. <laughs> the night before my wedding and I had to draft my documents. <laughs> so I was just as guilty as everybody else. Um, but once you get in the habit of, of planning, it becomes easy. You guys are already here. You're looking for the information. So now you're, you're, you're in the mindset. So that's good. Um, but tell your friends, it isn't that hard. And it gives you a peace of mind. And I'm going to explain a little bit that I learned um, that I actually put in my representation agreements as part of the reasoning for what we are doing this for. And part of it is because we're parents or we're the next generation, we're teaching people how to do every stage of life. And the last stage, which is the end of your life, you have to teach too, and people don't. And it's important to spread that word out there. So the next, item is acting, getting this done. It's all very nice. I, I have two or three files all the time in my office where I've prepared the paperwork and no one comes in to finish it off. Or it takes people a year or more to come in and face this. Um, so what are those barriers that are creating issues? People seem to think that there has to be perfection or they, I've made a recommendation usually when they want to do an unequal division of assets and I'm pushing them to say, I don't think it's gonna stick. So why do you bother trying to do this? It's very hard to cut out a child. What are you teaching your next generation? So I'll be pushing one way and the client will be resisting and, and that'll sometimes lead to delays. Um, 
people have very fixed ideas about their estate plans. They're often kind of not something that we can do. I have to say that. We try and draft an estate plan that we think will last for 10, 20, 30 years and have safety catches all the way along. Um, but give you a warning, like if something unexpected happens, if you get a grandchild who's disabled, come back to me because there's some things we have to deal with that are different than, and, and help the family out. You don't want to end up with a situation that you didn't expect. So reviewing it. Um, but teaching your family to have a plan and acting on that plan and showing them you have a plan is a great motivator, I think. Um, now, number three was the legal side versus the, the less legal side. So I've had very few wills that don't sound boring as heck. I had one lady who was a spinster and I call them my fun wills because if you're a spinster, <laughs> You have no obligations to anybody and you can pretty much do what you want. And those are sometimes more fun for us because we can add little extra things. And she actually said, because my friend was such a great friend to me, I want to give her X. And that's an unusual thing to actually put that emotion in a will. It's not that you can't, it's just people tend not to push back at their lawyer and say, why are you giving me this goobly gawk in this? But you can, you, you can actually put some more emotion or what we tend to do is use memorandum, non-binding wish memorandum, which are morally binding, particularly on your children. If you say, I wish to have this type of funeral or I wish to have the distribution of these particular mementos or personal effects this way, or you want to leave, and I think you should always leave something positive, it would be nice to leave something to somebody that's, that's meaningful. Um, if anyone here been to seeing a family member pass away and see how the children react about the gifts they've given them during their parents' lifetime? Anyone ever seen that? Yeah, the, the kids usually want the gifts they've given their parents back. It's <laughs> whatever, <laughs> but they'll be looking for the little mementos, the teaspoons or whatever it is that they, they spent time shopping and giving to their parents. And they want that stuff back. Um, the, other, the other thing you can do as you age up or you have this coming is don't wait to give things away. Um, talk to your children. If you are downsizing and not planning on having any more Christmas dinners, then give the china away give the stuff away and go visit it. That's easier to simplify and hopefully get rid of it then. We do end up with people being most fussed after you're gone about those little things, the little emotional things. So it's better if you're in control because the, the, the topper always is, if mom wanted it, this would have happened. Yep, so now mom wanted it and this is what did happen. Um, now the basics, a will, a power of attorney, a representation, advanced directive. Okay, hands up, who's got a will? Okay, guess how many I have? I have two wills. <laughs> and people probably don't even know we can do that, but there are situations where we do multiple wills for people. I have one will to control my law office because only a lawyer can come in when I'm passed away and control my law office. And that person then reports to my main executor to, to, to work that part of the will. So I can have two probates. Um, hopefully we don't need to do that, but that's what the law society says because unless my executor was a lawyer for my general estate, no executor can come into my office. We do double wills for people with high wealth in corporations because there's some tax savings and probate fee savings we can do. We do dual wills for American citizens who own property in Canada, so they don't have to bring a will from the United States into Canada. So we have lots of reasons why we're doing multiple wills. So your will, if everyone understands, controls your assets and property that you get in your estate, this is important, after you're dead. So lots of things don't go into your estate. Life insurance doesn't usually go into your estate. 
Um, RSPs or RIF money doesn't go into your estate unless you designate the beneficiaries as the estate. Um, joint bank accounts often don't flow into an estate, so you have to be very careful. There, there can be a lot of controversy around joint bank accounts. Uh, jointly owned houses that are with right of survivorship don't go into your estate. So when you come into my office, I need to know what happens. So we got a husband wife team. It's usually pretty clear we want to have jointures everywhere. So they don't even have to come into my office except for one little piece of paper for the land. And everything happens using a copy of the will and the death certificate and it's all done. Saves lots of money, saves lots of time. Um, on the other hand, we also can see elderly parents relying on one particular child who's local and they joint account things. And that is not the plan. And I have to know that if it is, because I will write in the will. It is my intention that this joint account belongs to X or this joint account does not belong. It belongs to my estate. And we get really clear about that. Um, in the last couple of years, we've also been able to do some really cool things um, because the law has allowed us to actually make gifts of the right of survivorship. So we actually do a gift deed that gifts the right of survivorship. So for example, if you come into me and you've got one child and you have a house and you're like, oh, I just wanted to have it without any issues, without probate, because a house is gonna require a probate to move because that's the way the land title system works. So we'll go, okay, well, let's do this. We'll put it into joint names, but, but your child will be declared a trustee. And the child's trust document requires them to do whatever you want with that house. So you can sell it, you can move it, you can, it's your, it's your house. But we'll also gift her in, the, in a deed, the right of survivorship. So during your lifetime, you're the owner, you get all the good tax advantages of having a principal residence. So on your death, there's no extra taxes. But the day you die, she has this, or he has this gift of the right of survivorship and so they can use that jointure to own it. So they can do some good avoidance of taxes and good avoidance of having any extra probate fees. So that's only been the last two years we've been able to do that. The Supreme Court of Canada recognized that particular narrow right um, as, a, as a giftable item. So that's been, been good for planning recently. Um, we also have the power of attorney. So the power of attorney is while you're alive, you grant someone your financial decision-making. Whatever you can do financially, you can gift to someone in British Columbia under a power of attorney. We have a standard form that we use. We often say there's a certain exclusion for land titles because the act will say in three years, your power of attorney expires for land. And then we get into much more subtle question and answers. So between a husband and wife, do I want the ability to use that power of attorney to take all your property and give it to me? Because it's forbidden in a power of attorney that you can actually transfer something to yourself personally for your own use. Makes sense, right? It's position of trust. You don't want someone to take your stuff for their own use. But we can have a discussion of excluding that limitation. We can specifically exclude it and it's binding. Um, we can all, and sometimes I've seen it used where one spouse is in long-term care for years and years and years. And you're like, well, if I die first, now this person becomes the owner of the house. And that's not going to be great because then that's, what does a person in long-term care need the house for? I think I want this now in my name only, and it's going to go to my children in my will because my spouse is largely provided for because of all their income that's going to pay for long-term care. And it becomes not emotionally burdensome for people to have to deal with a for spouse with dementia and always have to renew the house insurance and deal with all the things that you have to deal with in their name. Um, it's not often used, but, but we talk about it. The other one, I don't usually give it to children. I, sorry, I just don't think it's worth it to have your child have that ability over you. Um, and most parents agree. The, the other things that we can do is build in um, clauses that permit gifting, because gifting is largely prohibited. So if you are the power of attorney for your spouse, but your spouse gave annually to a church, you can't really do that. 
because they're giving their money away, which is not a position that a trustee normally does. But we can accommodate that. Or if you have, every family's got a few family members that they give a little extra cash to, a child, an adult child, whatever. And you can just continue that tradition of support if that's required and build that into the power of attorney. Most people don't need that, but we have that discussion. And that's why sometimes doing it yourself, you don't know these things. You don't know all these little loopholes, these little catches and things that we will discuss and, and co cover off. Um, now, the other thing is when you want to change your power of attorney, there's specific things you have to do. Once you've named a power of attorney and you decide, well, my son is now moved to the United States and I don't want him as my power of attorney because he's not around, I'm gonna need my daughter instead. We have to do a revocation and we have to serve it on that person or that new power of attorney isn't valid. So we have to be careful that we're meeting the technical requirements so we don't end up with a problem. And it kind of makes sense. The government says, you know, if you've named someone as your financial decision making, they need to know, are they still in the game or not? You have to go through these specific processes. Um, let's see, do it yourself, good plan. Um, now, doing it yourself, <laughs> okay. You, people call me from time to time and say, we, I've written my own will, will you be my witness? And I go, nope, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, I can't think of maybe more than one hand home done will I've seen that I thought met the requirements that, that need to be met. I'll see home drawn wills that give away a house and give away a car and give away a pension plan and then don't give away the residue. And if you don't give away the residue, you've got a will that has failed. Um, because often all these assets change and they don't exist by the time you die. So you've just created a real, you've created an intestacy in any event. Um, I, I've had wills that you can't even understand when they're home drawn. You're like, I don't know what they're trying to do here. Um, and sometimes assets cannot be given away. So I had one recently where I give my pension plan to my spouse and if she dies, I want the rest of the pension plan to go to my son. I'm like, uh, pension law covers pension plans. My first year property professor who was the expert in wills and trusts in Canada, Dr. Waters, um, was an amazing man. And one day, I think about four years after I graduated, I called him up and I said, I have a problem. I said, I've got this, this file and I don't understand. But it, uh, he asked me a question. He goes, is the property alienable? And I went, I don't think I pay attention in class because I don't know what that question means. <laughs> what it means is you can't give away something you can't give away. You can't give away a pension plan because there's laws that cover it. So it's not alienable. So you can't control it with your will. Tough to toots. That's that. That's what he meant. He goes, first question, can you actually deal with it? But of course, he used a strange word to me, which I thought, oh, I learned, I learned. Um, basically, my advice is if you do it yourself, you're making lawyers a hotbed of disputes. And there's lots of lawyers out there who love to litigate over files. So be very careful about doing it yourself. Now, this changed about five or six years ago, very rigid rules about wills, where Oh, I'm back. Okay, that was weird. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we had really rigid rules. If you didn't have formal validity of a will in the way that the law required, you had no will. Um, now the court can take an imperfectly drafted will and try and find your intention as the will maker. The problem is not necessarily bad, but it means almost anything can become an intention. So if you have notes in a computer file, you can enter that into probate. If you have um, given instructions to a solicitor and die before any wills done, that can become a will now. Um, if you have your old will at home and you start writing all over it, then the question is, is that a changed will? 
and we are now dealing with that particular problem. And sometimes what we're finding, you know, obviously what we get is a copy of mom's old will and the daughter has made notes on it. So now we have to sort out what was mom's intention versus what the daughter wanted changed. And I, I guess they're trying to cure this old defect, which is people would have wills kicked out that should have probably gone in to now almost anything can go in. I mean, I just sit there and think of the family dinners I might have had in the past where someone started spouting off about, well, in my will, I'm going to do da, 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 da. And I think, oh, my good grief. You know, someone has a copy of that videotape, it might come in as a will. Um, so again, now people come in, we send them drafts, and we say on your copies, do not, do not make notes. Everything that you do is, this is for contemplation, discussion only. This is not my intention. And, you know, we do the best we can. So again, you could sit at home tonight and write a holograph will, which is like the old fashioned, this is my last will and testament. This is what I want. Date it, sign it, no witnesses. And there will be a court application with evidence to see whether or not it is your will. So I guess in, in a real pinch, you can do that, but it can lead, as you could probably suspect, to some mischief as well. Um, now let's talk about the plan, the, the idea of a good plan. So you come into my office, I need to know kind of all these details. If you're a nuclear family, are you a blended family? We have very different considerations and there's more and more blended families. Um, if you have alienable assets or non-alienable assets, we have to deal with the tax issues that come up because people might have big registered plans and the only person they can roll it over tax-free to is a spouse. I don't want you designating your children as the beneficiaries of these plans ahead of a spouse. Even if it's a common law spouse, then we talk about reallocating the rest of the estate. Um, <coughs> Sometimes you come in and the, the hardest challenge for me is a blended family with stepchildren and the need to bind these people forever. Because the rule is you come in and do your will. I can't stop you from going tomorrow, revoking it and doing a new will. And it's not uncommon for mom and dad step they have all these stepchildren dad dies mom comes in three years later and says yeah i don't think i need to give those stepchildren as much as i was going to give them and i i can't stop her and those stepchildren have no rights to make a complaint about this because they don't have a right under any of the legislation to challenge it the only way to bind that up is to get a marriage agreement which I don't do, I send people off to divorce lawyers and family law lawyers, and we attach the wills as contractual requirements that they have to meet, and then give the children understanding that these contracts are out there. Like that, That's where we talk about transparency. It's like, okay, I see a lot of grief with stepchildren, and grief can be made even before the parent has passed away. I have seen it with the stepchildren stepping in as powers of attorney and litigating before the other spouse is dead. I've seen this happen um, where um, dad didn't provide for mom in the will. They both have dementia and the stepchildren are litigating uh, under as their power of attorneys as to the division of the state before anyone's passed away. And it's, uh, it's quite a mess. So when you have a blended family you really need help because some people are really great and carry on the wishes but i would say that's not as common as people would hope um we also can do other things um if you have a black sheep that you really want to cut out who has a right to assets and it does happen we can then say well we can do a trust Trusts are expensive. Uh, they're their own legal entity, so they have to file their own tax returns. Um, they can create a lot of fees because when you move assets into the ownership of the trust, they have transaction fees associated with that. So, and, and sometimes trusts have different requirements. So 
If you're not yet 65, you have to have a family trust. If you are over 65, you can have different types of trusts that preserve tax situations, which are, which are pretty handy once you reach a certain age. But all of them come with costs and usually you really, really need to have an accountant involved. So everyone sort of has a plan and we go forward. We see these more with our higher wealth individuals with blended families. And basically everything's in a joint family, spousal trust, sorry, spousal trust. So the two spouses while they're alive and after the death of the first one still use all the assets to their pleasure and joy. And then at the death of the last of them, it distributes out amongst the children that they've designated in that trust. So it does, it never goes to probate. Um, so the next one is just a little detail. When people come into my office and they have had mom or dad arrange for their funeral, it's a, everyone's happy. I'm just gonna say this, no one complains when someone has pre-planned that. Um, pre-planned the extent of the service, but in particular, when my mom passed away, it was very sudden. She'd been sick for 10, 12 days. We knew she was gonna die. It was gonna be a sudden death in the hospital. It was a sudden death. And then we stood there and looked at each other and went, now what do we do? We got a person who's deceased in this room. <laughs> and it took the nurses, about an hour before they came with funeral home numbers and they just dial a funeral home and they make arrangements to come and get your mother. And that's how it works. But we didn't know who she was going to see. We didn't know whether she wanted to be cremated. We didn't know whether she wanted to be buried. And I, I was sure she'd made those plans 20 years ago. So I didn't bug her about it because I thought she'd registered it with her, her church. She'd talk to me about it, but there was no plan. Um, and it was stressful. You get into the situation where you have to dress your mother for her funeral. Um, you have to decide whether you're going to have a casket funeral or you're going to have a cremation before. The, all these things become very, very stressful. And it's better to take that off of your family members who are already dealing with your loss and take care of it yourself. Um, I, I, you, if you know me, you know my dad's a lawyer. I grew up in a family of lawyers. My uncle was a lawyer. And when I turned to my father and said, so what did she want? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I almost lost my shit. <laughs> I was like, what? You did this all your life and you never had a conversation with your spouse about this. Um, I had one conversation with my mother and that's the only one that anyone could recover and my recall and 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 he goes yeah that sounds like your mom <laughs> i was like okay that's what we're gonna do then um so it comes down to the issue of transparency um i it, it for me it crosses with the issue of undue influence so for example i'll have someone come in with a relatively complex set of allocations because they've advanced one child hundred thousand dollars over their lifetime and they want to deduct that and i say okay did you let your other kids know you were doing this like nope never discussed it that was secret i didn't want to tell them i'm like okay this is not going to be happy happy world unless everyone's understanding what's going on and it has some expectations so please please discuss this with your children that this is going to happen and you want to hear the objection now, not after you're gone, because you've left this with your executor and you don't want to have a problem. Better to know now than leaving it as a pile of mess for your family to sort out along with your loss. Um, the undue influence issue has been perking along. And just so people understand, if someone comes into my office, usually an older person, Usually they are living with one child and they have two or three other children um, and they come in and they want to do something that isn't normal. They want to give most of their estate to this one child who they're living with. I'll be like, okay, antenna are up because that's not normal. 
And then I need to have them in alone because often that child wants to be in the room and I cannot have them anywhere near. It's like, get out of my office and I need to talk to your mother alone. And I go through a set of questions that the Law Society has given us, um, particularly issues about their dependence and their fear of losing that support person. And if they're in a position where I think that one, they're not socialized with other people around them, they don't have friends, they have no other family that sees them, and they are scared of losing that child's support, I actually refuse the service. I document it. I've got two cases now where the people have passed on and the, so they went somewhere else, like to a notary and got it done, not through me. And the fight is on and I'm like, you're not gonna like what's in my file because I refused it and I documented it and I sent you away because I'm not allowed to do anything once I've determined that there's undue influence. So if you have people involved, if all the other children had been involved in this decision to give this one child most of the estate and they all went, yeah, no, no, that's fine. She's doing all this work and it's not a big estate and we think she should get it. Then it's hard to show undue influence, but generally people are kind of greedy. So we're always sort of watching for that. I, I mean, my, my parents taught me that you don't wait for a dead man's shoes. And so I don't really tolerate a lot of that sort of plotting and thinking that's a good thing to do. But the, you know, sunshine is the disinfectant. In other words, keeping things above a board and keeping things understood really does assist in getting to the end result. My duty is not just to the person who comes into me. It's my duty is to make sure the beneficiaries actually get what she wants or he wants them to get. So I have multiple requirements for my job to make sure things turn out at the end. I, I mean, there isn't, there has been little glitches along the way. You know, for whatever reason, you miss a word or you have a word that was wrong. You know, it's like, oh my God, I didn't read it. I read the well five times. I didn't see it there. And usually we can work that through, but I don't ever like to be in that position. So how much does it cost? So I, I charge $375 an hour and I kind of base my fee on how much time it really takes, but I make it a fixed rate because it's easier for people. So I call a simple will, your nuclear family will. That's where, or a single person who has no other obligations and can kind of do what they want. So if you come in to me and you say, well, I want to give it all to charity, that's pretty simple. If you come in to see me and say, I want to give it to my wife and then to my children equally, if she predeceases me, that's pretty simple. That, that's standard stuff. If you start having custom drafting or I've got to send you out to get a marriage agreement to bind up the will, then it gets a little bit more pricey. So for a couple, I charge $840, which kind of reflects just over two hours of time. And that includes the intake, the interviews, the preparation of documents, the execution, sending documents off sometimes to other children because they're not in town. We do letters and such, and we track that. And that's the full package. That's the, the will, the power of attorney, and the representation agreement. Uh, if you're a singleton, it's a little bit more because you get a bit of a discount when you're a couple because it's just you're doing the same document with flipping the names around usually. So it's just under $500 for a singleton. If you want to know the pricing, quote, a la carte, we have that. So if you just want a will, single person, 320. If you want a power of attorney, depending, power of attorneys, again, we have different clauses, how many people are going to be your attorney, that kind of stuff. It's between $125 and $150. And a representation agreement between $175 and $250. And those are single person rates. Um, when we, I'm going to talk a little bit about representation agreements. Anyone here have a representation agreement? Okay, good. Um, so most of them are pretty standardized. We, I, I, I kind of like to define some of the terms because there's major healthcare and minor healthcare. And it refers to some legislation. People are like, oh, I don't understand what that is. We go through that. We go through the fact that it can touch on other things that isn't that aren't just healthcare. 
Um, the representative can control who visits you if you become incompetent. So you're in a care home or you're in a hospital. Um, they have access to your legal paperwork. They can, they can access documents on your behalf. So it's a little more subtle than just healthcare. We cover over that. Um, we also discuss in terms of your healthcare decision-making, I, I prefer to give person a lot of discretion, but ask you to talk to them specifically about what you think end of life should look like for you. Um, I know there's like a lot of workbooks out there that, that sort of will assist you. The, the important thing is if we have religious constraints, I've got wording for that. So if you're a Catholic, I've got wording for that. Um, I have wording for Jehovah's Witnesses because there's obviously limitations on what you can do medically with a Jehovah's Witness. And where I find them, most people are going now, and I've mentioned this to my wills group, a lot of lawyers out of Victoria, I said, this is the one that's working for me. Um, I name usually everybody as a representative. I'll name the, the spouse and the two or three children, all are representatives. Instead of having this person, and if this person's dead or incompetent, then this person. And the reason I do that now is because it's something where one person's available and sometimes that's only a temporary situation that they're not available. So I've had a spouse who just came out of surgery who was the representative and the husband had a heart attack. She could not manage the decision-making period for only about a week or two. But he was in limbo because the alternates couldn't make a decision because she couldn't be kicked out. So now we kind of do, okay, let's just name everybody with the proviso that you wish, it's not mandatory, you wish the non-spouse representatives defer to the spouse. And they're only being named in the event she or he is not available. And then if the other ones come in, the children, that they must confer and you want them to agree. Every family is different. Some people just say, nope, it's going to be my spouse. And then I need my kid as an alternate. And then my other kid as a further alternate. That's fine. I'm just finding this sort of more flexy way. People think that works a little bit better. But that's just a consideration for everyone to have. Um, I've done that. My, my daughter is my representative. I have two girlfriends who are my, my co-representatives. And they're to defer to her which is fine and not, there hasn't been any issues. I've had a few surgeries, nothing's come up that needed a decision, but uh, it was nice to have the girlfriends there because my daughter was in university. She wasn't even aware I was even having surgery that day. My girlfriends were sitting there waiting for me to come out of surgery. <laughs> um, now, the last thing I was gonna talk about is the estate and probate per process. Um, we try and avoid it if we can, because it's kind of expensive. Um, we charge usually between, well, a minimum of $3,500 to do one because it's just the amount of time and effort it takes. We gather in all your asset information. The executor has to uh, sign off on a number of documents. We send into the courthouse. There's a two or three month process where we get the documents back. And then the court issues official papers saying you're in charge and you pay a fee to the government. And so that's where people want a lot of savings is they don't want to pay the fee of the government. The fee is 1.4% on the high end. There's uh, the first $50,000 is 150 bucks, but everything over 50,000 is at 1.4%. Sometimes it's better to pay that 1.4% and go to probate than to have, I trust you joint account distribution because sometimes you can't trust people or they have marital breakdowns or they die first. And so those plans don't always work as well. And when we tell people what the probate fee and the legal fees are, they go, eh, okay, you know, it's not so bad at the end of the day. It's not like a government's coming in with a 20% tax or anything like that. Um, so the estate and probate process, yeah, everyone, can avoid it if they want to if they've got a really good plan there's some dot there's some new investments out there if you if you've liquidated everything as an elder person just have a rental apartment and you have three or four hundred thousand dollars in non-registered funds i can give you 
reference to an investment person who can put you into an investment that's like that gift to write a survivorship. So you have control, but they only get it when you're dead. It kind of works like a registered plan. I, I would do that if that was my situation at that age. But that isn't, most people aren't there. They want to keep their house. They want to, they want to have their stuff and, and control it. And they're fine with a little bit of a delay or, or, or uh, such. And, and sometimes if it's really simple, I've had one recently where it was just a house, just one house. There was no bank accounts or nothing. And I reduced my fee because it was pretty straightforward. So I didn't even charge the 3,500. Now, when I say 3,500 is usually the bottom level, it can go into one to one and a half percent of the estate value. So, you know, you can have 10, 12, 20, $30,000 fees on certain estates. And sometimes that's because you've got corporations, you've got to do all these transactions, you've got notices that go all over the world. You can have um, estate litigation issues. So I say, I quote out, I charge you a fair fee. That's what I say. You'll feel it's fair at the end. And these are the factors I'm considering. So uh, just so you know, that's how I do it. I think a lot of the other lawyers are pretty similar. I don't, I just had one from England come in where the state is in England and my client's in Canada. He's the executor. And when I read through their fee agreement, I went, oh, pretty much the same as us. That's interesting. It was slightly different, but got similar aspects of percentages plus hourly rates. And I thought, eh, it's about the same number. So I think we've got, what, 15 minutes for questions? I've talked too much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. I found that <clears throat> a lot of information really interesting. So I'm just going to open it up now for questions. <clears throat> I'm sure, excuse me, I'm sure a lot of you have um, some questions for Susan while we have her. Who would like to go first? Janine? Hello, thank you. That was informative and I have pages of notes. <laughs> I'm a, a bit of a note taker. Um, so I had my will created with my husband about five years ago. We were living in Alberta. We're now in British Columbia. And I, when you said um, the gift of survivorship, adding that to my will, is that something I should just like get it all in BC now and add that to it and update it? Is that your well, so opinion? Is it between you and your husband or are you thinking about your children being on some assets as well? What are you thinking? Um, yeah, probably, at, at, probably changing that around. I, I imagine there's a few things we would change around. So it's always good to review your will two to five years or when you change jurisdictions. Sometimes we don't need to change a will at all. Um, if, if you had a jointly owned house with your spouse, you don't have to worry about the gift of right of survivorship. It's presumed because he's equal with you. It's a, it's a marriage. If you add your, say he passes away and then you add your children to title, you don't have to change your will to do the gift of survivorship. We can do that outside the will in a deed. So, and then we create a trust. So you don't have to muck with your will. And, and, and a will done in any common law jurisdiction, Quebec might be a little different, but any common law jurisdiction like England and the United States and Canada and any province is probably acceptable in British Columbia. We have okay. some issues with getting our wills into Alberta because they require an affidavit of the witnesses. So if you were moving back to Alberta and you took a BC will, you have, might have a little issue. Just okay. so you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? And, or Ashley, sorry. And then next will be, sorry, it says Pixel. <laughs> I think it's Susan, right? Yeah. Okay, Ashley, go ahead. <clears throat> um, when you're doing up a will and your kids are very young, and you want to put something in there for if you and your spouse were to pass away, do you choose somebody to like hold on to assets until the kids are old enough to, to take that on or how does that work? Yeah, so, so what happens in every single will I do, if we have children involved and even grandchildren, we name the executor also be a trustee. So what happens is there's always a standard clause because we don't put that clause in, the money goes to the public guardian trustees. So we make sure there's a standard clause that says if any person's under the age of 19, these are the terms. And we have a standard sort of set and you can change it. You can change the age range if you want the kids to have the money in trust for a longer period. Um, I, I fight with this. If you know your kids are pretty responsible, 
it's expensive to keep a trustee for years and years and years. But sometimes if there's lots of money, you don't want 25 year olds to get lots of money because they'll blow it. So everybody who comes into my office has different reasons for different age ranges. But yes, you need to name guardians, right? You have to have a guardianship and a trusteeship. And sometimes I'm concerned if the guardian and the trustee are the same person, right? Because now the person's paying themselves to take care of your kids and advancing money for expenses. So you have to have some sort of concept of how that's going to work. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Susan, you're next. Or is it um, the pixel? That's Susan, isn't it? And then next is Stephanie. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Can, am I on? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. I have actually two questions. Uh, my husband and I moved from Prince George to Campbell River, and we have our, um, we've done our wills twice in Prince George. Our son, who is the executor, still lives in Prince George. So does it make sense to um, have it, have another will down, done here in a year or so, or just keep it up in Prince George? Uh, I... You can bring it in for review and I could just cover off the things, see if anything's changed, like grandchildren have come along, you wanna do anything different. But generally you don't need to relocate your will. And, and with today's day and age, you can have executors in all sorts of places. You, uh, don't, okay. have to, you, you don't have to name an executor in Campbell River. Sometimes it's easier to have a power of attorney a little closer, but again, you know, we're pretty good at doing things long distance now. So. Right. Just have a review. It's worth having a review just to make sure everything works for where you're at. Okay. And nobody's, the, the lawyer in Prince George's nose wouldn't be out of joint about? Well, okay. So you're asking, a, that's a, probably a different question. Some lawyers, and my dad was one of them, um, would hold the wills. I don't hold wills anymore. I still hold about 400 of wills from back to 1949 because I was a good girl and took my dad's wills on <laughs> but largely they're all defunct but the law in British Columbia is you cannot destroy a will at all so I have a ball and chain with me I carry this box of actually safe of wills around and someday I think I'm just going to ship them to the law society and say your problem not mine um, you can destroy a will if you can prove that that person is deceased they had a probate that went into court and it's been 10 years since everything in that probate's cleared. So first of all, I'd have to research hundreds of files to see if they died, which a lot of them have. Two, if they go into probate, probably 30% of people ever go to probate, right? A lot of people don't bother going to probate because they have jointures or they, they set up their system, they don't have to. And once I hit that problem, I'm like in the never never land of this will can never be destroyed. It'd be really interesting one day if one, someone wants to do genealogical re re research, maybe we should send them to the archives or something. I don't know what to, every original will in British Columbia is kept once it goes to probate. It is kept in Victoria or in the different courthouse registries in Vancouver. They're never destroyed. So, so ultimately then we have a copy and is that considered the copy? The no, real thing? Not the a original copy. Will, you can ask for your original will at any time. You don't have to leave it at a lawyer's office. There is a form that's filed at the Vital Statistics office. You can come into my office if you want. And, I, and it's cost 17 or 20 bucks or something to file it per will. And it says, my will has moved. This is where you'll find it. And often we'll say bedroom drawer or safe in the closet in the bedroom. You're like, that's where it is, fine. So that's easy enough. It's, it's good to file that notice so people know you have one, have a will, and two, where it, look for it. So, so essentially then if, if we have a will, say, in our bedroom drawer, yep. is, is that the will that the executor would work with? Yep. Oh, Absolutely. Okay. And, and in today's day and age, again, because things have got more flexible, you can, all, you can always enter a copy in if you can't find the original, if you can establish that that's likely the original was lost or destroyed and never changed. So one piece of evidence is that's the last wills notice that ever existed was that will. 
and my will matches that date and it's done by the same law firm who filed the wills notice. And two, what was the reason it's destroyed? Well, I've had everything from a person got dementia and one of their little habits was to hide stuff, to <laughs> squirrel things away and we can't find it anymore. So, and often what'll happen is when I do a will and I send the original off of the client, I scan it that day and I can certify that as a true copy from then on because I know that that was the real copy of that will. And then you have a final consideration, which is the common sense one. Is the will that you're presenting what's gonna happen if you don't have a will anyway? So if you have a will that says, my eldest son is the executor and I want it distributed amongst my kids equally, guess what? That's probably what would happen if you didn't have a will. So why make a family go through all that suffering of going in without a will when you have probably a copy that's gonna be the same result? There's no real risk to entering that copy. It makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so um, sorry, um, it's Carol. I keep calling you Susan, correct? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> and then next is Caroline. <laughs> okay, so so me. Um, yeah, I'm still just trying to wrap my head around all of this. And so I'm wondering, as far as power of attorney and executor, if for my husband and I, does it work to have each other as both of those? And then from there going on to our adult children? Yes, it, maybe. that is how we normally do it. Uh, sometimes a spouse doesn't want to when they get very old and frail. They'll say, no, just give it to the children. I, I, I don't, I'm not right. the business guy in this family or whatever it is. Um, right. Then the question becomes amongst your adult children, how do you want to handle it? Um, sometimes we name two children to be individual uh, power of attorney. So right. each of them can do it without the other one around because maybe they live in different towns, but then they can check on each other, right? If, if one person is writing checks on your bank account, the other person can call up the bank and say, send me a bank statement. I want to see what's going on. Or sometimes you just say, no, this child is number one. And then this child is the backup. And you've had that conversation as to why you're doing it that way. There is a couple little things you always have to keep in mind. If you have US citizen, US taxpayers, not even citizens, US taxpayers, we don't like them to be involved in some of your financial transactions because the US tax code can suck your state into their tax return. And so we try and avoid US taxpayers. Mm, okay. Um, and then representatives, I'm still a bit confused about how, what their role is. What are representatives? Because <laughs> you were saying, you were saying oh. spouse and children can so, be named. So, okay, so I, I'm having a little technical difficulty. So if I didn't get this right, so the representative takes care of your healthcare decision making for the most okay. part. So often. In a husband and wife situation, if you come into my office, you're both 30 or 40 years old, I often say you probably don't even need a representation agreement. If you call, if you if your wife is ill, they're gonna take the instructions of the husband without a lot of issues. It's when you start getting older and your husband could predecease you suddenly, or you are now a widow, you do need to have decision makers, or you're like me, single. Um, so is that more to do with your medical directive? Okay, so so there's the healthcare <laughs> representative, which is like more robust thing. You can consent and refuse consent to surgery and life support. An advanced directive is like a single piece of paper, and sometimes I use this for older people, which just says pull the plug, do not resuscitate. Right. Right. I don't want extra care. The downfall is on those younger people. The younger you are, the less likely a doctor will accept it. And it actually provides in the thing that you have to understand that the, the hospital or doctor may refuse to use that advanced directive. It's their right. Um, and there is a subtle thing that happens. I said on the hospital ethics committee, if you have a DNR on your file, you tend to get slightly less care. And you mm -hmm. have to understand that. that, that sometimes wow. nurses will say, 
oh, Ms. Jones is swelling up because whatever's not working in her body and it's causing you pain. Oh, but she has a DNR, right? So maybe we won't call the doctor tonight to deal with this problem. That's the problem with a DNR. It can, it can lead to some odd treatment things that happen in hospitals. Not, no one, not everyone just dies from a sudden heart attack or like my mother, she had an aortic abruption and boom, she was done. Some people have issues and it takes a long time and their body goes in and out of homeostasis and it's very painful and discomfort and uncomfortable. And you don't want to get fluids. You do want to get fluids. There's all sorts of things that go on. So I wish it was easy, but everyone's very individualistic. You just have to know that your own situation, what you think is going to happen and what, what could happen in terms of uh, life support treatment and maybe being left to linger in a place you don't want to. Most people want medicine. <laughs> Most people want drugs. <laughs> they don't want pain. Right. So is there not then the option of how in that situation, like a palliative situation of having comfort, what's called comfort care? That's what the, the representation agreement has usually a standard wording. We usually have the standard wording in the case that uh, there's no reasonable chance of recovery. I want medication administered to leave right. pain, uh, even though it may hasten my death. Like yeah. everyone says, yes, that's the one clause you have to put into my, rep my representation agreement. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're, 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 you're muted. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> now it's Caroline and then next is Hannah. Okay. Hi. Susan, I wanted to thank you very much for doing this. It's been really helpful, but I just have a quick question and I don't know. Um, can a lawyer be an executor? Yes. Yep. And, and what, what's the ramifications? Is it expensive or what does it mean? And, and um, how, how do I find an ex a lawyer who would be an executor for me? Okay, so I do do it from time to time, particularly with single ladies who don't really have a lot of other choices out there. Um, I think I charge less than other <laughs> executors. If it's, if it's relatively simple, I do have some requirements, like you have to give me your, all your assets and the key to your house and there's various things. Um, I generally propose to charge an hourly rate or a fair fee. I did one recently with an elderly lady who passed away. She didn't tell me she moved, which was a bit of a problem. But at the end, I believe my fee came in around $5,000, which was pretty reasonable, I thought at the time. Um, we can do a compensation agreement. The thing that gets a little, sometimes I just say I get paid according to the trustee act, which is the standard clause everyone gets. And then I have to get the beneficiaries to approve my fee and show them what I did. Um, sometimes I want to enter into a, a compensation agreement. It gets a little hedgy. Sometimes you got to send you out for ILA, right? Because now you're contracting with your solicitor. And it's better for the solicitor who's in a position of fiduciary power with you because you're telling them a lot of your personal situation that you then go on and look at the fee agreement with another solicitor to, to agree to it. I, I know it sounds complicated and some people don't like that, um, but it's no different. If you hired a trust company, they would charge four and a half percent plus minimums. I don't know if you've ever seen what trust companies charge. Um, I know that when I've talked to Horn Coupar, which is a big law firm down in Victoria, who's well known for doing a lot of estate work, they're much more reasonable than that. So there are firms who've done it for years. I will do it sometimes. Um, so there you go. Thank you. And, and, and I just missed your name at the beginning. Ah, Susan. Susan Sinnott. And, and you can get everything from Louise. She's going to have all my contact information. Okay. Good, thanks, so. thank you. Who's next? I think. Hannah? <laughs> there we go, Hannah. <laughs> um, I have a question. Whoops, sorry, Hannah, um, you're on mute. There that was my fault. Sorry about that. Um, I have a question for childcare. If my husband and I were both to go, um, can it be argued? Like if it's in the will, like if I say my mom will take the kids, how like can that be argued by other people? Yeah, it, it can be. Um, at the end of the day, it's guidance. It's your wishes. If it's reasonable, 
I mean, it generally will have some weight, but anyone can contest uh, custody of a, of a child in court. Um, it's some of the worst battles I've ever seen in my life. And, and it, it doesn't happen so much in your situation where you're together, but I saw it happen with um, a husband and wife who had divorced. And back in the old days, you could grant full, if you had full custody, you could grant full guardianship to another person. This person granted it to his, her sister who lived in a different province. And I've never seen a war like I saw that war. That, that was horrific. Today though, you can only grant the guardianship you yourself have. So um, often, thankfully, my, my, my wills have permitted that the, the spouse, the former spouse will say, I grant guardianship to my, my wife, my former wife, who's the mother of this child. Um, and failing that, then my guardianship should go to blank, right? Because she can herself grant off guardianship differently. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, we just have blended families. Like I have step parents and stuff like that. So that's the worry that I have is that like my dad would come in and argue about care if my mom took them, that kind of thing. So, so one of the things we can do is the same thing as when you're cutting out a child and we expect there to be litigation later on, you can swear a declaration for use later on in court for your decision-making. Like we will draft that up for you. For you. It's not part of your will, yeah. but it's available as to why you're making the decisions you're making. Like you might say, well, in my experience, my father was not reliable or whatever other reasons you had. He, he believed in harsh corporal punishment and and that's not what I want for, for the raising of my child, blah, blah, blah. You can, you can the, the, the most important thing, if you're gonna do evidence that's gonna be relied on when you're gone, yeah. is that it has to be super accurate and not subject to any embellishment or gilding the lily because then you, it's very easy for a person who's there versus you who's gone yeah. to attack it. That's good to know, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do we have any other questions for Susan? No, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, so um, again, thank you so much, Susan, for doing this for us. Okay. If anyone has any questions for Susan or, or needs to get in contact with Susan to book an appointment or whatever, um, you can contact me and I'll give you her information. Yeah, and make sure if you call my office, you tell my receptionist that you came through the hospice presentation. We control my appointments pretty strictly with COVID. And so we're very careful about who gets in the door right now. So um, I'm prepared to let you all in. So that's yes, <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> we got it in. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Susan. You okay, no problem. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a lovely meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.